Okay, so we're uh, we're coming in now to part two of our discussion about uh, the relationship uh, of live events and the environment, and the responsibilities and actions that can be taken by uh, event organisers and event suppliers to reduce the carbon impact of uh, of live events and help educate the people who are going to them. I think we talked about that a little bit last week. Last week we talked about standards uh, and how really the sporting industry has probably led the way in terms of uh, you know sort of persuading suppliers to get their mm. their ISO 14001 in place and things like that whereas festival organizers have probably been uh, not as, as 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 proactive in that way so in some ways the sporting mm. events are leading kind of what they're doing there but in other ways there are some absolutely kind of fantastic festivals who are blazing a trail with what they're doing and probably being more creative and more passionate uh, throughout their event in, 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 in the ethos they've got. So it's, it's an interesting the cross the crossover of what could be learned from each other. It would be nice for the festivals to um, especially review the new 14001 standard that came out about three or four weeks ago and almost use that as a template and go through it and go, right, are we covering that? Are we looking at that? Is that something that, so communications, are senior management involved in the process of actually disseminating um, the message across to all of our suppliers of trying to reduce that impact and going through the standard and almost it would help to tie it all in together to help have a uniformity across I don't know across the whole of the UK yeah sure Re reflecting uh, again on the uh, industry manifesto survey of 47 festival organizers people want festival organizers want clear information a clear idea of standards um, so some kind of uh, approach in the festival industry to agreeing uh, what we are working to uh, collectively and, and having having resources to support that w would would be of benefit. Maybe we could put together a um, kind of questions and answers. So using the fourteen thousand and one standard and saying right, if you can answer all these questions, you know, so it would almost tie it in, so that then they can go, well, we actually adhere to that fourteen thousand and one standard. They not may not necessarily need to be certified against it, but they can say. We adhere to it. Sure, I'd I'd love to explore that with you, Will, especially because my um, uh, reflecting on ISO twenty twelve one, which was the legacy of the Olympics. It my uh, concern with it um, was that it was more accessible in terms of cost and the um, sort of bureaucracy around it to much larger organisations. So it didn't suit the dynamic and often uh, small organisations mm -hmm. that small to medium organisations that inhabit uh, a large part of the um, independent festival sector. But also, we were talking about the fact that in ISO 2012-1, um, there's a lack of meaningful continual mm. improvement. So it can be a box-ticking exercise. I'm very encouraged by conversations we've had outside of this interview about how the culture around 14,001 uh, compels companies to actually make meaningful changes. I guess the pure the, the fact that we... Um, I guess it's... I see companies changing and I see there's such good buy-in from companies and trying to be more environmental. I remember getting shouted at by a client of mine because um, I was talking about how much money they could save, and she looked at me and went, this is the CEO of a large advertising agency, and went, it's not about that, Will. We want to do things because we want to reduce our impact. And she, w and it was lovely to hear, but I, and I was a bit kind of taken aback, but there is that drive, and mm. she is what is going on but then are the sort of people that I'm talking to that want to become more environmental by pure virtue, you know, yeah. am I talking to a very small segment of our corporate society? I mean, it, it's an interesting question, isn't it? We, we, we are um, largely numb as a human population uh, to the urgency and the reality of the fact that our Earth, our life support system, is literally on the verge of ecological collapse. We're currently experiencing uh, a period of mass extinction, um, the, you know, um, rainforests are disappearing at a phenomenal rate. The ice caps are melting. Um, we've we've overfished the oceans to the point where most feedstocks are collapsing. Forty percent of the Earth's surface is covered in cattle, and and um, uh, and we've all heard these facts mm. time and time again. But that sense of urgency that we actually need to do something um, is still sort of lacking in in business sectors. I mean, we can't. We, we, we've watched two decades worth of international politicians achieving nothing, no meaningful progress whatsoever, apart from avoidance of any legally binding targets. 
So we can't look to our political mm-hmm. leaders uh, or even leaders in the business, most business sectors to create this change. And so I'm really passionate and very clear that um, every person listening to this podcast, every person in their daily lives, every person with influence on decision-making in their businesses, we have to do this now. Mm. And, look, and Meet Free Monday yeah. is something that we ask a lot of our clients to do. And it's such a simple thing. It's just, you know, just don't eat meat once, once yeah. a week. I mean, my dad was a meat and two veg every single meal. <laughs> he was from Leeds. And <laughs> uh, it was amazing. But, um, it, but that, see, this, you go down to the CO2 emissions, but you get the impact of having meat free on one day is actually mm. enormous. And the benefits to your health, let alone anything else. Yeah. So, so, this so is I the, mean, that, you know, we've talked about waste, we've talked about fuel, we've talked about, I mean, f- food is, is uh, again, uh, from, you know, from an event perspective, you've got people on site for days, it's an opportunity to influence habits and educate kind of thing. But, mm. I mean, food's a, food's a huge kind of a part of the, the carbon footprint of, of, of our human race, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the issue that, that nobody wants to talk about, really. Um, some studies have suggested that perhaps 50% of total greenhouse gas emissions globally uh, is from the cattle industry, from agribusiness. So that's, that's cattle themselves, the methane, that's the, the processes to produce the feedstock for it, the manufacturing, the transport. Um, whether it's 50% or not, it's, it's a significant carbon impact. Uh, and, well, actually, no. That, we talk about carbon. Uh, actually, what we should be talking about is greenhouse gases, which is mm. the basket of six greenhouse gases put forward under the Kyoto Protocol as, as, as me- how we measure global warming potential. Um, the issue, of course, with cattle industry particularly is that uh, methane, you know, which is 20 times more potent in terms of uh, the warming effect in the atmosphere and immediate. Um, so, it, yeah, meat is a huge is a huge issue. I just come back from a couple of weeks ago from ADE Green, and there were some inspiring um, presentations. One of which was from a woman called Stephanie, who manages Tollwood. Uh, it's it's a fairly mainstream event. It's city centre based. A million people attend this as day visitors, uh, and they did an experiment. This is in Bavaria, where people like their meat. Um, but there were two main food courts. One of the food courts, uh, she decided to go vegetarian uh, and almost vegan. Um, she certainly didn't tell people that because the t- tent would have been empty. Uh, but what she found was that um, because they were very careful in terms of the quality of the offer uh, and they weren't making a point of it being vegetarian, that actually it did as well financially as the meat tent. And people were saying, uh, were discovering uh, and making, may were making different choices about what they were going to eat that day. They were discovering foods they didn't normally eat and actually the response was very positive. Mm-hmm. So it's... it's uh it, it, as I understand it, f- food is not something that is, is generally considered at, at, at a sporting event, at a music event particularly. It's kind of it's not on the agenda, really, is it, that I've seen to date. No, no, it's not. At Shambhala, we've worked with our food supply chain quite intensively. Um, we want to know where, where the meat, the dairy, the fish particularly um, is coming from. Uh, and we found that, that, that concessions and traders are very willing to work with us um, and in terms of making changes, uh, what we've done is stated an intention and worked with people over three years, uh, made, made clear what our goals were, uh, and instead of imposing immediate changes, we've kind of worked with suppliers over, these three, th- over th- three years generally and mm. been very successful, and, um, with the exception of cooperating in one food standard agency prosecution around um, misrepresentation of where meat was coming from. Um, we found that that a lot of our suppliers are very willing um, to improve the provenance, improve the quality, uh, adopt fair trade um, and organic um, certifications along the way. Yeah. Do you use the red tractor screen? Do you use the MSI? MS, it's MSI for f- um, fish, isn't it? Do you use different standards that you can equate to larger catering companies like Compass all put in... Um, particular standards like that yeah i mean we i find certifications difficult um the soil association organic is robust and meaningful or considered by most to be so um fair trade um seems to be fairly robust but there's a uh there's literally hundreds of mimic 
certifications uh, which certify to different standards and things like the red tractor well even a lot of um, free range certifications for eggs they're not really worth their salt it's, it's actually mm. a marketing exercise by the industry to wriggle out of genuinely robust standards so I, I mean it's it's a minefield certification but there are a few that are genuinely robust in my opinion I mean, so, yeah as you say sort of at, at, when you've got a sporting event where there's a, there's a you know, mm. th there's a lot of corporate hospitality on board, mm. campus or Sedex or whoever is mm. cooking. You know, there, there are there. You know, they, they they're not here in the room, but I'm sure mm. they're 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 very aware of their uh, the efforts. And I've I've certainly been aware going yeah. to sporting events mm. that it's locally sourced. Yeah, I've seen a see a ch uh, have seen a change in the f the fact that the supply chain are now talking about it. And it's becoming a part of the contract. Yeah. To win that contract, you have to have. And yeah, I mm. agree with you that those. There are lots of standards that you could get a lot better. A lot of people out there, when they even start thinking about reducing their carbon footprint or you know the, env the environment, they think, "What's it going to cost us? You know, time and money. Money. It's going to be more expensive. We're going to, you know, it's kind of you know, and can we afford it? It's it's. Uh, what would your response be to that? Say, Will, it should be cost efficient. Very tight. We we cast ourselves as an environmental management consultancy because. You reduce your energy, you reduce your cost. You re reduce your environmental impact, you reduce your cost. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been an interesting journey for us as a group in terms of powerful thinking because uh, how how are how are we most effective as an advocate and provider of resources uh, in terms of sort of uh, an agent of change and. You have choices, you know, do, do you appeal to people's altruism, uh, do you appeal to pe people's brand integrity, um, do you appeal to um, the audiences, the, the festival clients, uh, or do you make the cost case? Now, invariably you have to sort of work with all of those, but sometimes we can make the cost case in it, with energy, uh, often you can make the cost case, not always. Um, in other areas of sustainability we find it more difficult to make the cost case. And then it becomes a, uh, and if it becomes back to the uh, all the more philosophical argument, then doesn't it? Is if we don't if we don't pay if we don't pay for that, what is the ultimate cost? Mm. And that brings it back to why you why you guys are doing mm. this. It's that kind of it is that passion versus cynicism kind of thing, isn't it? There's a lot of people out there going. What's I think I guess it depends on the size, yeah. doesn't it? It really does depend on the size. The larger you are, the more cost efficient it is. Mm. It's. Uh, and, and I think it's kind of uh, with the, with the, with the with the events marketplace, music and sport, they can they can play a very uh, important kind of um, role, if you like, in changing people's mindsets in wider society. As you say, you was, was it three point one million visitors to summer festivals. Mm. It's kind of you know how do you how do you feel? Do you, is, is it that passion that, that clearly you two have both got, the, and that is there in the industry to to, to help educate people and get those habits into them? I'm um, hugely excited by the potential role that festivals can play. Um, we have captive audiences. Um, our audiences absolutely love the experiences we have. We have the opportunity to inspire people and for those three days we have the opportunity uh, to normalise and give people a very positive experience of um, living in a slightly different way. Now, I'm not personally an advocate that every festival on this in this country should suddenly become a green activist, you know, but I think that by embedding good practice in our organisations and talking about the way we do things and continuing to, pr to provide creative and musical inspiring experiences, people carry um, uh, ideas which are going to help us move towards a positive future away with them from our events and I think that the role we can play is quite profound there in society. Mm. I think we can punch much bigger than our weight in terms of behaviour change than larger industries. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, similar with sport, I guess, isn't it? You've, yeah. got, you've got very much a, 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 a lot of people having a very positive experience doing watching something they want to be part of. And, and Except the nice thing about festivals is that you're able to, you could almost be more wacky in your behaviour change. You're a, you, you've got more of the out-of-the-box thinking of, well, let's just do this because it will get people thinking in this way. With a sporting event, it is quite corporate and it is very much, you've got a particular standard you've got to adhere to because your client wants you to um, have that exact red carpet or that exact green carpet. So, 
there is an element of that. I mean, what, but interestingly, one, one of the other areas that has you know significant uh, carbon impact on with any event is is the, the transport. You know how you how you get in your hundred and forty thousand people in and out of the Ryder Cup or your your, your, your bigger mm. festivals, as you say, and it's kind of. I th- I, from what I saw at something like the Ryder Cup, there were a lot of people who were parking their BMWs and getting on double-decker buses who probably haven't been on a bus for God knows how long. You know, mm-hmm. In all seriousness, you're changing people's habits and going, hey, we're going to put 50-odd people on a bus at a time to get you in and out efficiently. You know, And it's kind of, it saves having a five-mile trail of cars with their mm-hmm. engines going, mm-hmm. you know, so it's, it's that kind of, and likewise for festivals, it's, it's how people get there and back is very important, mm-hmm. isn't it, Chris? Uh, we find that for a typical festival, um, if you look at the carbon impact, uh, well, first of all, we generally look at the on-site or operational impacts when we're considering a carbon footprint. So that's everything that the organisation, the festival itself, is directly responsible for in terms of what happens on that site. That does include supply chain in terms of transport, contract to transport, supply um, but if you look at the extended footprint in geek language um, or the uh, festival related impacts, we find that for any for a typical festival, seventy uh, percent will be travel, audience travel, and thirty percent will be the festival itself. So it's certainly an area uh, of significance that we can influence. And uh, it is that if people get used to car sharing, get used to getting on buses to think, or mm-hmm. you know, and actually being encouraged to do it, I think that you can, which you can do through price breaks or yep. there's all sorts of ways that an organisation or just hey, we haven't got a car park, you're getting on a bus 15 miles yeah. away, and that's going to you know <laughs> because of that 70 percent of um, carbon footprint, are festivals chosen geographically, or do you think? There will be a move to right. We'll move this festival, so Shambhala, to a more transport-friendly hub, so that. I mean, I I don't know. I was just thinking about yeah. what you were saying. I think I think currently that wouldn't wouldn't be the primary vo- motivator of, of of site choice. Um, um, but I think I mean, obviously the the, the role of. Um, Transport varies, like Reading and Leeds, for instance, is more city-based, and they all receive, and it's a younger demographic, they'll receive the majority of their audience through public transport, so they've got a great footprint. Um, a more rural festival will will have a more significant transport emissions footprint. But like, Glastonbury is a fantastic example, because they've, since 2011, I, I think, they've run the Green Travellers scheme, yeah. and I believe, don't quote me on this, that uh, now more than 50% of the entire audience of Glastonbury arrive not in private cars. Which, for a festival of that scale, which is rural, uh, is is a fantastic achievement. We've just been gate crashed. No. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah, yeah. No, it is a fantastic achievement. So I, th- I think, uh, as I said, it's it's it, the, the organisers can do a lot to mm. you know, if the transport management is. is, is if you sat in that queue for Glastonbury, though, <laughs> you wouldn't want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking from experience, there is it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good. Good. I'm thinking we're kind of going to wrap things up fairly shortly, uh, but uh, I don't know whether there's anything else in particular that... Uh, in, in, in terms of transport, um, uh, we have recognised the significance of transport emissions um, through co-founding a project, uh, an initiative called Energy Revolution. Uh, and the idea is that at point of sale, um, the audience is uh, able to balance. We don't say offset. We don't think that's sort of scientifically correct are able to balance their uh, travel emissions by making a small donation um, toward um, the project. The project is focused on uh, investing into renewable energy. So what we're saying is uh, priority one is always reducing impacts. Uh, but for unavoidable impacts, um, there is something positive we can do. We can, we can actively take part in changing our national and international infrastructure from fossil-based to Renewable, which absolutely needs to happen. All the UN reports are saying that you know this is this is imperative. Yeah. Um, so that, that's that's been launched by ten festivals last year, and is reaching out and engaging with audiences around this issue. But we're also talking to the supply chain and to ask artist rep- representatives about how we might work with those constituencies to to tackle travel impacts. And that those donations are going to go to non-renewable energy. That's a renewable energy uh, creation. Yeah, what, what, what we're doing is creating, uh, effectively crowdsourcing uh, a, an investment fund in renewables. Um, we're currently a company with 
charitable objectives and registering with the Charities Commission to be a charity. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, an in, it's a specific festival industry project which hopes to work with audiences, artists and supply chain to recognise travel impacts and do something positive about it. Sure, yeah. From, from, from your side, uh, Will, are you, are you, are you, you're dealing with, we talked about the supply side of mm -hmm. it, you? you've also talked about, obviously, and we've seen sporting organisations being really responsible for, for you know, they're aware of what they mm -hmm. can do and make a difference kind of thing. It's, uh, I mean, in kind, of, in, in kind of wrapping up, do you think there's a long way for the, the sports industry to go? And, and, and if you're a supplier in that sort of sector, whether it be sport or music, what, what would your kind of, what would your advice be sort of for the positive side of me would say that um, I think we're on a really good journey and I think that um, we are quite environmental but quite frankly we've got an awfully long way to go we can think about so many ways of reducing our impact through energy through tra um, transport and the way that we manage these sporting events and the what the way that we design our tents why aren't we looking at the way that our tents are designed why what sort of air conditioning are we using? Or do we need to have as much air conditioning? What about the throughput from air? Are we taking into the geographical locations into consideration? You know, there's so much more we could actually do. And I think we're just really just it's icing on the cake at the moment of reducing our waste. And I don't know, there is so much more we can do. So if, if someone's out there and they're listening and they think, I want to. I want to get on board with this, whether it be an organizer or a, a or a, a supplier who's thinking, yeah, okay, I'd like to. I'd like, I'd like to get this this, this ISO standard and, and do mm. my bit. How, can you just tell tell the, the listeners how they can reach you both and for, for to get copies of the copies of your new uh, uh, report or reach you for advice on ISO? Yeah, just so come to our website www.greenelement.co.uk um, and contact details are on that info at greenelement.co.uk. And we, I'll just give you as much information as I can to, in order to help you um, reduce your impact and implement an ISO 14001, 2012 one, be it what you want, but ultimately we'll help you reduce your impact. Yeah, and, and yeah there's a wealth of free, free to use resources, case studies, uh, a fuel tool if you want to have a look at how you compare to industry average in terms of how much fuel you use. Uh, the industry average is 0 0.6 litres per person per day, by the way. Um, You've got some great stats, Chris. <laughs> oh God, my head's, my head's <laughs> absolutely full of them. Um, and there's uh, the Power Behind Festivals Guide, which is due for a revision in February. And as you say, most importantly at this stage, the show must go on. Um, report um, for a download at www.powerful/thinking.org.uk. Thanks very much. Thank Chris, you, Chris. Well, it's been a very uh, engaging conversation. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.
and you're in such a lovely position to be able to almost drive much more of an impact. But I don't know, you touched upon organic. Can you feed everyone through organic? Uh, is it, is that, I mean, you know, you've got, I don't know, you know where I'm coming from on this. And there's a lot of arguments that say, actually, it shouldn't be organic. It should be just um, good quality, happy meat is I think a term that's around at the moment. Yeah. And, um, but I personally live to your standards. I actually do buy largely organic meat. I adhere to Soil Association. I also subscribe to it, you know, so, but that I, I can afford to. So I, I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it is that stuff, isn't it? You know, and having kids and things that you think about it, mm. you know, we we don't have we don't we stop eating sausages and processed meat and things like that mm. now, and it's, it's veggie sausages instead, and the kids mm. are on board and they love it. And it's kind of, you know, start making your own sausages, brilliant. <laughs> start making your own sausages. Yeah, we make I, we make our own sausages, and it's in a proper yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> We're gonna do another video on how to make your own sausages. <laughs> <laughs> I um. I mean, it's complex and emotive, isn't it, food? Yeah, I agree with you, Will, that um, to know your suppliers. I think that's um, it, isn't it? To source locally mm. and to look at standards around animal welfare and to look at the quality of your produce are all mm. things that we should be focusing on. Mm. I think that's a great place for us to wrap up and go down and get ourselves some, uh, some food. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much, Will. It's Thanks very much for inviting um, us. Thank you. Let's, well, let's hope that we're we're sitting down in a year's time when you've got your hundred festivals signed up, Chris, and we can start seeing some differences being made. Oh, I hope so. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you very much. Yeah. Happy with that? Yeah. 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 Do you know we what? Some, we got some good information across I'm, there, gents. I was so close to saying, I can't believe you're wearing the same T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Week two. Hello. Week two. Week two. Oh, here we are in week two. <laughs> That's why I start smiling at the beginning of it. I was like, I so want to say that because let's face it, everyone's going to notice that I'm wearing the same shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Um, good spot. Yeah. I'll just stop recording now.